getting from the couch to the contract. My name is Michael Wallace, and you'll be with me for the next 60 minutes. Actually, this will probably be a bit of an abbreviated one. Um, and really, my objective over this time that we're going to be together is to cover some, really some basic principles around really uh, you know, getting to that first contract. And they're about understanding your client, it's about leveraging your network, and it's also to position yourself to win. Now, in my own business, sometimes my biggest challenge is actually getting from my own couch to the contract because we can get kind of stuck in this area of where I'm working on developing a new offering or a product or a service, or maybe I'm prototyping something, or even I might be researching. And it's all stuff that's around a product service, which is all good stuff, but it's actually doing very little around moving me closer to that contract. I'm doing very little activity directly with a potential client. So I'll be recording the session, and that's what you're listening to right now, so you'll have access to this material, and then at the end, I'll let you know how you can get a hold of me if you want to work closely with me. But for now, let's uh, get a bit closer into getting to that contract. So before I go on, let me just let you know a little bit about myself. Um, I am a, a consultant slash facilitator slash coach, and really most of my career has been in various sales positions where originally, you know, selling consumer packaged goods and moving into IT and software and services, and then into pharmaceuticals. And i got to be honest, the whole time I was in sales for 20 years, I never really liked it. Like, I never liked sales. I never... I was never the guy that got really excited about the deals and all that stuff. I was, I was okay as a sales rep. But what was interesting is that when I finally left and stepped away from corporate and then started up my own company, that I started to discover I actually enjoyed the sales process because it became very tangible. It was something that I could really sort of sink my teeth into and you would see that immediate impact of doing something, right? So when I think back to, you know, the first time that, you know, I got, you know, started talking with the client and identifying their need and then us getting to a point of like, okay, so do you need to put together a proposal and putting together a proposal and all that stress around that and getting that in and then them saying yes. And oh my God, the high when they say yes. And then the low when you realize you didn't charge enough. But, um, but then, you know, moving forward and getting the PO and then putting in your invoice and then, you know, making money from that, you know, getting that check, depositing that, you know, and then moving on to the next one. Like that started to be like, wow, this is exciting. So I got to be honest, I, I do enjoy this whole part about going out and getting projects and getting new things. There's, there's a bit of fun in there that I find. So to give you an idea of what is this innovation, what does it do? The company is really divided into three areas. And the first area is where um, I do a lot of work with, let's say, pharmaceutical and life science companies around with their sales force and essentially working with the sales direction and getting sales managers and sales reps to just be more effective. And I do this through a lot of communication training, leadership, a um, bit of coaching and developing with them as well. And there's some technical training that I do in there, but it's not, it's not a lot. The next bucket that I do, and this is where my role as a facilitator comes in, is where I just do a lot of facilitation and training around management skills and leadership skills and communication and conflict and all of that. And this is where I just go around working with large corporations and just delivering, delivering these programs, whether it's a one-day, two-day, or three-day program. I just do a lot of that. And then the third one, the third bucket, which is where you guys kind of all come in, is where I work with entrepreneurs and self-starters and, you know, what I call free agents, you know, people that are, um, they've got something, they know what they want to do, they know what they're really connected to, they're just having a bit of difficulty getting to that first contract or they're already doing something and they're already successful, but they want to get to that next level. And that's where I get in, I do a mix of coaching and consulting. Um, and it's, the coaching around is helping them, so how do they move from, let's say, some of the roadblocks or some of their barriers um, and then the, uh, the consulting part comes in and says, what's the knowledge that or experience that I have that can help them move forward? So just specifics around, you know, how do you have that conversation with the client? How do you get to that contract? How do you negotiate things? You know, how do you work through, let's say, billing and things like that? So that's all part of, part of what I do. So um, really what we're going to do is we're going to dive into really the guts 
of this stuff right now, which hopefully will probably take only about 30 minutes, and then we'll leave things open for questions. Um, and uh, um, we should be okay on time, I'm, I'm pretty sure. So the concepts. So the three concepts that is going to help you move towards the contract is positioning yourself to win, leveraging your network, and understanding your client. Now you'll notice that these aren't in any particular order. You know, like I don't have them bulleted one after the other. I don't have the number beside them because you know what? They aren't in any order. And in fact, they don't even happen in silos. So there's times when you're going to at the same time leverage your network, work on your networking while you're trying to understand your client, right? You could be, let's say, building your network or getting in touch with someone while you're having a conversation about trying to understand. And then it could be even, you know, while you're positioning yourself, maybe you're leveraging your network to do this. So that's why there's no real order. There are just three key concepts. And, and there's, so why do I, why do I boil it down to these three is that these are really the three that I find when I'm in the mode of I need to go out and get some new business, that these are the three sort of pillars that I go back to and this is how I do it. So, so that's why I kind of think it's sort of the most bang for your buck. So the first one, understanding your client. What do I mean by that? <laughs> it's a big question, right? So for me, getting an understanding of your client is really understanding the challenges that the person or that department or the whole organization, what they're dealing with. Now keep in mind when you're dealing with companies, you know, there could be an overall challenge that the, the company is trying to deal with, but ultimately it's really it's one person that you're that you're selling to. You know, sometimes you're dealing with groups and committees and stuff and, and with bigger deals, but you know, there's someone that's usually mandated with the responsibility to fix something. So essentially that company problem becomes their problem that they need to take care of. So it's really understanding that and understanding the impact of having that challenge or having that issue of what it's what it's doing. But that's really kind of getting down to understanding your client. So when I first got started in sales, it was funny. He said, how do you understand the client? And I remember a manager said, you know, well, go research. Go find out about, you know, this industry. So I then went to the Internet, you know, and um, started to research on how telephone companies work and where they get their revenue and how their business model works and all that stuff. And I ended up spending a lot of time trying to understand their business, but yet I wasn't talking to anyone. So I, I talk about this because sometimes we have a tendency of maybe putting a lot of time into research when, yes, we do need to do a bit of research, but we don't need to do a lot of research. We need to get a general idea, and then immediately we've got to start talking to people. Because talking to people is where we're really going to kind of find out the truth and sort of what's really going on, right? And it's not just talking to one person. It could be talking to multiple people, okay? So when I'm actually having that conversation, when I'm talking to someone, inevitably we end up talking about two things, the present and the future. So the present is really, well, what are they doing? What's their situation today? What are they currently doing? What's, what's their, what are their people doing that's, that's causing this problem kind of thing? And then the future is, well, where do they want to be? Like in 12 months, what they, what, what's going to be different? So in 12 months, they think about their team, What's different at the time? Or six months. Also, there's another thing is it could be, you know, the future might be attached to their objectives, right? So you can find out what's that person's objectives, what are they trying to accomplish in the next 12 months with their team or their department or their company. And that can help you identify really where they're going to. So why are we doing this? Why am I trying to find out the present versus the future is that I'm really trying to identify what the gap is. And the gap is exactly that. Where are they now? Where do they want to be? And in that gap, this is where, this is like the hard part, right? And this is where they need help. Um, if they knew exactly what to do, it wouldn't be a headache, right? It wouldn't be kind of a challenge. It'd just be kind of going through ticking boxes, getting things done. But what's important about the gap is that it's important to have this identified because this is really where your product or service work comes in, right? This is where you're going to be able to position what you have that's going to fill this gap for them. So it's important to have that identified. And ideally, you want that gap to be, you know, something that um, you've got a product or service that's going to solve. Now, as we get in and talking to customers, and one of the things that happens sometimes, actually, as we're trying to get an understanding around what's going on with the customer, is that 
our conversations sometimes might get too big, right? Like we want to know, let's say, what's keeping you awake at night? And they start talking about something that really doesn't have really anything to do with an expertise that we've got. So what's key when you're having these conversations about, you know, doing this, what we call the gap analysis, is you want to really frame the conversation around something that you can help them with. And I find what I do with my customers is that I'll, I'll point right at the beginning, you know, like I'm the guy you want to talk to to help you have a more efficient or more effective sales force out there. You know, or I work with organizations and sales organizations to make their sales teams more effective through more effective communication skills or through, um, you know, being proficient in all their tools that they're using. But really you want to frame that because what happens actually sometimes is you get into a discussion and opportunity and this gap is really big and maybe it's out of your scope of what actually you can accomplish. So I know this happened actually with a client where we were working with their sales force and becoming proficient in using iPads and technology. And what came out of it was that really the scope of what they were trying to accomplish was so big that I myself didn't have the expertise to do it. So what I needed to do is I needed to pull in some help. So I had to go and get another consultant that has more of a specialized expertise on this project so that I'd have that in my team in order to close that gap. But the other thing that came out is that was we're talking about the gap is that you know, there's things the client needs to take responsibility for. There's things that they need to do in order for the success of this project to happen. So when you're identifying in the gap there, it's a great conversation to really outline what do they need to do in order for them to be able to reach their objectives, let's say, in the next 12 months or whatnot. And that's your responsibility, right? Like you can't take on stuff that you can't solve. And you have to be able, as a consultant, you have to be able to point that out to them, okay, and what they need to do. So remember, so the key thing to remember with this is that gap analysis is like where are they now, where they want to be. And that differential is where ideally your solution is going to fit in. Here's the other thing that, I like, I like getting into, which is about, and I call it a checklist, I call it the Holy Trinity, not a religious guy, but um, really it's about three key things that you need to have to answer the question, is this a real opportunity? And the first one is that have we identified an urgent need? Is there a timeline, right? Is there a timeline associated with this urgent need? Because if it's not urgent, if it's something that's going to happen in two years, then you know what? Maybe we're not talking at the right time, okay? The next one is, is that are you talking to the right people? So are you talking to someone who has the authority to make a decision? Are you talking to someone who can say yes? Or is it just people who can say no? So you want to make sure you've got those right people either around the table or in the conversation. And the last one is that do you have access to budget? Do you have access to, to funds for this? So in an ideal situation, you know, you're in talking with people. And you ask about money and they, yeah, I says, I've got budget. And in fact, this is exactly how much budget I have. That's an ideal situation, right? But that really kind of happens. One, they never really tell you what, your, what their budget is. But for them to actually have the money waiting there for you to take, it's kind of rare. Sometimes what happens when you get into this is that it's, they might not have the money, but they can get access to the funds. And I've got a client that's exactly like that, is that you know, we go project to project to project, and each time we do a project, she just goes, you know, does the whole proposal, internal resources, gets the funding for the project, then we move forward. So as long as you have that, that's great. And this reminds me actually of a case of two months ago dealing with a, an e-learning project with a company that it was exactly what they needed. It was a solution they needed. Timing was right. We had the right people around the table. They were the ones who were making decisions about the money and everything. So, but unfortunately, they just didn't have access to the funds for the proposal that we were putting in there. It was just it was too big. So we could have talk to her blue in the face about this, but we can't, without facing the reality of that they just couldn't get the funds, then we're kind of just wasting our time. So decide, just pull out. So remember, that's the holy trinity, these three things. Make sure you, you've got identified timeline, it's urgent, you're talking to the right person, you've got access to funds. So that's really kind of the whole concept on understanding your client, right? Like that's, we're digging in and it's about talking to people. It's um, it's having those conversations. And it's having conversations with more than one person. So as you can see, there's a bit of a crossover, right, with your network. Leveraging your network is about, um, you know, just talking to sort of different people. Now, I just want to say there's a caveat here about leveraging your network. There are multiple ways to leverage your network. And 
I can't really I can't get into all of them. Really, what I want to focus on today is how do you leverage your network to set up a meeting with someone. So, in the case you know, for example, you're you know you've got the best solution in the world. You know that company over here needs what you have, but you just can't get a meeting with that right person. So, how do you how do you leverage your work your network to get that? So that's what we're going to focus on. But I just want to say a couple of things about your network. One is is that your network is something that you continually need to be paying attention to. You need to be working on. Um, so your network is not. Let me tell you where your network is not. Your network is not all everyone that's connected on your LinkedIn profile, or everyone that you've got on Facebook, or everyone that's following you on Twitter. Those are people that through social media that you have, let's say, touch points with but they're not necessarily your network. Really what your network is, is your healthy network are the people that know who you are, know of you, know what you're doing. It's also probably someone that you can probably pick up a phone and talk to, okay, if you actually need to, or you can send an email out to them. Now, when I say that you gotta keep it healthy, it doesn't mean you have to go and have touch points with all of these people, but what it does mean is that you need to be doing something so that they're aware. They're aware of what you're doing and what you're up to, so that you know you it, you're never kind of like for a year they're going, gee, I wonder what this person's up to. So that's the idea of kind of keeping your network healthy. However big your network is now, it's not big enough. You've got to keep working on it. You got to keep feeding this thing so that it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay. <clears throat> so let's say this is the person you want to talk to. They have a problem. You can see they have a problem because you can see that they're holding their head, their face is red, right? They got a headache. They got a big problem to deal with. And then for this scenario, we already know that they are the decision maker, so they have the authority, they have the budget, and they obviously have an urgent need they got to take care of. But guess what? You don't know who they are. But here's what you do know. You know that they work for XYZ company. And you know this because you've got a couple of friends that work at XYZ Company. And every time you talk to them, they're complaining about this problem. And, you know, it's maybe getting a bit too much because they keep complaining about it. So you know you've got a network in there. This problem exists. And there's someone that's responsible for taking care of this problem. So your objective is to get a meeting with this person that has a headache, right? So how can you do it? <clears throat> well, there's multiple ways to get this meeting with this person. You know, you can go very direct route, which is maybe call up reception and talk to the receptionist. Say, yeah, I want to talk to the person in charge of, you know, it's back-end office systems. And you'll get connected to that person and leave a message. But we all know, in let's say the whole cold calling world, that the success rate of doing calls like this and actually having someone pick up the phone and, and having a meaningful conversation with them are very low. What I find, what I often do, is I try and avoid this and I want, I'm looking for really kind of a warm introduction to this person. So that's what I need to do. So my objective is to get a warm introduction to this individual with the headache. So I need to target someone that's within my network for this. And what it is, it's someone who has a direct relationship with this person with the headache. Now, how, how do I do this? So if you think back to, let's say, a dinner party you're at or a cocktail party or a backyard party, you know, inevitably, sometime during the night, maybe the host comes up to your hostess and says, hey, Michael, I want you to meet Kevin. You know, Kevin works down in engineering at whatever company. So you guys must have a lot in common. And then the conversation will then start, and you'll probably start with on the topic of engineering. So that kind of idea of someone doing that introduction, we all know that that helps and that works. It makes things easier. But what's key, though, is how the introduction is made so that you can activate this idea of reciprocity. Reciprocity is the whole idea that I do a favor for you, you then kind of feel slightly indebted to do a favor for me, right? But it's like, you know, what's the exact favor that needs to be done? We don't really know. That's kind of the ambiguous thing. But we do know that we're just hardwired. We have a tendency to want to return that favor. So what you're going to ask is you're going to ask your contact to introduce you to this person. And it doesn't have to be a face-to-face -face introduction. It doesn't have to happen at an event or whatever. It could be as simple as picking up the phone, leaving a message, or it could be composing an email and doing it. 
But what's in the email is what's critical. So it's got to be something along the lines of, so let's say this person is, this person's name is Kevin. It says, Kevin, um, I want you to introduce you to Michael. Michael is an expert in getting sales forces to work more effectively. And I know that the issue you're dealing with is around sales force effectiveness. I think Michael is someone that can help out. Or he's someone that you probably want to talk to. He's got some interesting ideas. So the way that this kind of comes across is that it's creating a, it's like this person's done them a favor. Your contact has done the person with the headache a favor by putting you in contact with them. So what it happens is there's a slight tendency for that person now that you're trying to get a meeting with to answer an email. So when you follow up with them, not only will your name might feel, feel familiar or not, whatever, but what's more important is that idea of reciprocity has been activated. So there's a higher chance that they're going to respond, that they're either going to pick up the phone call, respond to your email, or whatever. Does it mean they're going to buy your services? No, of course not. But your objective, remember, here is to just try and get that first meeting. Okay? So very key in all that. Now, the caveat in all this is that, one, it doesn't work all the time, right? I'm just saying what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to set you up for the best success so that it can work. I know for myself, there's multiple clients that I've gotten into where I'm starting, to, where I did work with them, that it all came from a soft introduction. It all came from that. You know what? I think this is. I think you want to talk to this person. He's got an expertise in this area. That's really what you're looking for. So, here's the other thing: is let's say you've done a diagnosis. You've done a diagnosis of your network, okay? And it just turns out that, you know what? There's no one I know in my network that works at this company or that's in, that works at this school or whatever, okay? So let's say, for example, I myself want to expand my business into Boston. And I want to do work with TripAdvisor. TripAdvisor has got, you know, this big head office in Boston, and they need all kinds of this sort of team building, team dynamics, you know, training and workshops and sort of paradigm shifts. I know it because I, you know, I'm assuming. So if I look through my network, who is it that either knows someone at TripAdvisor or who works at TripAdvisor that's in my network that can get me a soft introduction with someone else? So if after I've done this whole diagnosis of my network and I see that, you know what, I don't have anyone. I don't have anyone that's like one degree separation that can do a direct introduction with someone that I need to talk to within the company. If I don't have that, walk away. If there's no fit, just move on. All right? Like don't sort of get, don't have this um, zeroed in um, idea or perception around I need to absolutely do work with this organization. There are plenty of organizations out there. And really the source of your business it's coming from your network. So unless you have the luxury of patience and time, then you're independently wealthy, and you don't need a deal in the next couple of years, well then yeah, work on your network. Work on your network and you know, get, get in, get to know people within that company, and eventually you, you can do stuff. But if you don't have that, then just move on. The key thing is what I said about your network is that when you're starting, probably most of your revenue will probably come somehow through your network. You know, probably for the, definitely for the first six months, maybe for the first year, right? It's after that and other things, your marketing efforts, your gravity marketing, whatever you're doing, that will sort of take hold and that maybe will start attracting people towards you. But really the first bit is you've got to rely on your network. So the idea is you've got to keep that thing healthy. Okay. So we just went through. We're still in um, leveraging your network. And I want to talk a little bit about really this template. And this template, this is for people who, who like templates um, and like kind of creating lists. And it's very simple. It's really who are the people in my network? So think of who is it that you want to try and meet? Who is that person with that headache? So who are those people that are in that network that maybe work within that company? What current support you know, are they giving you? Like are these people, can you count on them to vouch for you of how great you are? Have they, is it someone maybe you worked with in the past? Is it someone that can really sort of intimately, you know, be able to support you in something? Or is it someone who just knows you? So maybe the support isn't really that, that strong. And the next one is what do you need from them? So, so from these contacts, specifically what do you need? Uh, do you need them to 
endorse you? Do you need them to set up an appointment for you? Do you need them to make an introduction for you? Or maybe are they just the buyer? You know, you need them to buy something for you. And then what are my specific actions that I need to do to move things forward? And I want to just take a minute, a minute to talk about actions. Because actions really are the key. For any entrepreneur, it's your actions that you're doing directly related to clients that are a, really a key determinator of your success. So for myself, I know that typically, on average, the projects I work on last about three months. I'm not someone that gets into these two-year long engagements, whatever. It's like three months on average. Sometimes they're longer, sometimes they're shorter. So if you were to ask me, Michael, what are you doing in December? Or what are you doing in January? I'd be like, you know what, I don't know. You know, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. I know I've got stuff that's going to be ending probably at the end of November, but after that, I don't know. The other thing that I do know is that, and I've just learned this, is that my sales cycle, which my sales cycle is the time that it takes me to get from that first conversation, discussion with someone that I'm, quali that I'm qualifying to lead, right? I'm talking to the right people, urgent need, and there's um, money on the table. It takes me about three months to kind of work through that to get to a point of where I've submitted a proposal, we've got a signed contract, and I'm ready to invoice. So there's really there's a three-month right, uh, cycle on that. So if I know that in three months I don't know what I'm doing, December or January, and I know that it takes me three months to get things going, then what I need to be doing is I've got to make sure I'm talking to people today. Right, so I have to I have to continually always be sort of looking at who am I talking with today, what am I doing that's moving things forward that I'm talking directly with clients. Now I can be talking to people, I can be talking to a lot of different people, but if it's not clients, if maybe it's just working on my network, maybe with other consultants and stuff, those are great conversations, but they're not directly with let's say an opportunity or something moving it forward. So I always gotta be conscious that I'm doing something today. Because if I ever find myself that I'm not if I'm not having conversations with clients today about things, then that's when I start to worry about in three or four months, what am I going to be doing? I don't know. So good thing to know. Those of you who like templates, great. So the last one, which is positioning yourself to win. And really, positioning yourself to win is a combination of a couple of things. So it's about you know this whole gap analysis and identifying what that gap is. Um, but it's also about you know, your network and having people that are going to support you and really understanding your client, right? So the gap, if you think about it, the gap, it's an incomplete puzzle and you provide the missing pieces. So if you look at it this way, where when you've identified that gap with your gap analysis, there's that missing piece. And ideally, your product or services are going to fill that, okay? Now, here's where the issue comes in, is that sometimes what we are proposing, the client doesn't necessarily sort of hear everything um, and doesn't necessarily sort of make those links as to how this is going to solve their problem, as how this is the missing piece of their puzzle. So what you have to make sure you're doing is that you are framing your solution in the language that they understand, right? And something that they really get so that they can clearly see how it's going to benefit them, how it solves a problem for them. So, you know, for example, you know, uh, all this runs, we run into all, all the time, let's say, trying to buy a television. You go into a, a Best Buy and, you know, they say, what about this TV? And they say, well, this has got, I don't know, HDMI, and this resolution, that, whatever. And then you're like, okay, well, what does that mean to me? Like, how does that really sort of help me? So if they don't, in the, in the TV store, if they don't bridge that gap for you and explain why it's so important, and what, what you're going to get out of having, let's say, those attachments or the, those access points, what you're going to get out of it, you don't really know. Does it mean anything? The same thing happens here in order for you to position your stuff. So what comes up for me when I think about this, about really framing it and making, let's say, my puzzle piece fit what they need is working with the client this past winter, we were working on a leadership development program for their, um, for their department. And I was talking with the director and, you know, we're getting clear on where they are right now, the issues they're running into, and where they see their team, you know, in six months or a year, where they want to get them to. Um, 
And then as we were talking about sort of my proposed solution, what I was going to do, I started getting pushback. You know, I guess like the client started saying things like, mm, that's not what I had in mind, or I don't really see it that way, um, or really what I think we should do is throw them into a room and have them present and, um, to the group and have the group, you know, challenge them in a whole bunch of stuff so that they, you know, learn how to deal with this stuff. And, and really, she's not wrong. Like the, the, the client wasn't wrong. It's just that I was running into these, to these barriers with her because I was taking the assumption that just by explaining kind of what I was going to be doing that they would see how that was going to help the team. So I really had to take a step back and really explain things kind of as a follow through. So, you know, we'd be talking, I'd be saying, you know, one of the things we identified is that, you know, the team doesn't necessarily support each other, you know, in uh, team meet or in meetings with other departments that maybe someone will speak up and then the other person will speak over that person and, you know, just not the communication, the team dynamics just isn't very good. And then, you know, the impression that it gives you the departments about how cohesive that team is, right? So that's one of the issues that you're dealing with. And then going back and talking says, well, one of the underlying aspects of what's causing some of that is just a bit of lack of trust within the team. And the, pro the issue is that probably the team doesn't realize that they have this, this trust issue. So what we're going to do is when we're going to do this specific activity, it's going to bring this trust issue to the surface. So once it's to the surface and we see it, then we can talk about it and we can deal with it and work through it. And then what we'll do is once we have that out there is then we're going to move into another kind of exercise or activity which is going to help build this trust and really kind of get people to sort of see each other so that at the end of it when we come out of this workshop, there'll be that really foundation of trust with your people. What that's going to do is that the next time they're going to be going into a meeting, as opposed to maybe on instinct not trusting what the teammate's going to say, is that they're then going to trust them. So what, what you're going to see in, let's say, your team environments, you're going to see someone speaking up. When someone else speaks up, they're going to build on what that employee was saying. So it's all around kind of that foundation of trust. When I was able to kind of reframe it and explain it that way, <clears throat> it made complete sense to the client, and the resistance went away. And that was just because when I was proposing, I wasn't putting it into language or it was an easy way for them to see it. So sometimes we need to really make sure that we're framing it so that our solution really sort of fits their puzzle. Now, I'm not changing my solution in any way. Like I'm not changing the workshops, the activities or anything. All I'm doing is changing the language around how I'm communicating it so it lands better for them. Okay? Make sense? Now, that was really the three concepts that we just went through. Positioning yourself to win, which we just talked about. Leveraging your network. Went through different, you know, ideas and exercises around that and how you leverage it. And the first one we went to, which we went into deep, was around understanding your client. Talked about the holy trinity and that gap analysis. So these are kind of the three concepts that, you know, for me, these are like the basics, like the, really the basis, the foundation of what you want when you're trying to, to get towards, let's say, that first contract. There's other things that we can go into, but right now this is, this is kind of it. So there is a space here for questions, um, and in this recording, because I'm having to re-record this, and there isn't really a space for the question, but what I wanted to end with was just thank you for taking the time to listen to this. And if you do want to work more closely with me, here's my contact information, Michael Wallace at mwallace at fascinnovation.com. You reach me on my number at 514-497-4808. And I offer, really it's a mix of coaching, consulting packages of where, you know, we can specifically work together closely for whether it's a time frame of six months, that's usually what I work with people on, we're meeting maybe like twice a month, and it's a combination of helping you get through some of just the, the, the obstacles that you're dealing with, but then there's also consulting around how to help you, let's say, go in to have these conversations or these pitches with your clients and working through that stuff. So I've got some clients that are, you know, they don't want six months, they want three months, but they want it intensely. So then it's like every week for an hour we're meeting. And the cost of that, we can talk about that uh, offline one-on-one. -on -one. But if you're interested, give me a call, uh, and we'll see if we can work something out. So I wanted to say thank you very much for your time. I'm getting you out of here before, um, you know, the end of the hour is open. And really this is, um, putting into kind of a summary around these really sort of key foundational things. Thanks for your time.